Good afternoon, beloved. Did we get you all in here? There are still spaces. So if you're looking for spaces, there's a bunch up front. And I know people love sitting up front in church. So <laughs> now's your opportunity. <laughs> we meet here in the presence of death to honor the spirit of life. Our voices may be the voices of grief, but the language is the language of love. Welcome to the First Church in Sterling, which is made sacred today by the spirit of love and community that you bring as you come to celebrate and honor the life of Cheryl Lauer. We come together today as family, friends, neighbors, and those who can't be with us, but who are with us in spirit or on YouTube. Cheryl's family and friends are a beautiful mix of religions and cultures, Buddhists, Unitarians, Christians, and those of other faiths or no particular affiliation are all present together today here in this church. Wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We may not be of one mind theologically, but we are of one need spiritually. We need healing. We need one another's help. The help that we can give to one another is real. Whenever someone we have deeply cherished dies, it leaves a place in our minds and in our hearts that can never be filled again in quite the same way. This is the meaning of love, that we cannot replace each other. All that we have would not be beautiful if we did not cherish it enough to feel very deeply when it's lost. And grief comes as a procession of feelings, which will eventually help to heal the wounds that are left by loss. When it enters our lives, we must respect it. So let there be talk. Let there be stories. Let there be memories. Let there be word pictures of Cheryl, which will kindle other stories and other pictures in other minds and hearts. This is a part of mourning, a part of remembering. Let there be room for tears, if that's what you feel, for tears at a time like this are an expression of our love. And let there be laughter as it comes, for Cheryl loved a good laugh and the chance to be filled with the carefree joy of living. Today we mourn the heartbreaking, too soon loss of Cheryl Lauer. Cheryl was not only a beloved mother, a global consultant, and an explorer of distant lands, but she was also the beating heart of her community, a tall, beautiful beacon of light whose presence illuminated the lives of all who had the privilege of knowing her. In the words of Mary Oliver, let us reflect on the beauty and wisdom she embodied. Instructions for living a life. Pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. Cheryl lived her life with a boundless sense of curiosity and wonder, embracing each moment with open arms and an unwavering commitment to growth and exploration. As a mother to her two beloved sons and stepmother to her stepdaughter, Erin, she nurtured a spirit of resilience and compassion, instilling in them the same sense of curiosity and adventure that defined her own life. As a global consultant and change partner, Cheryl's impact extended beyond borders, touching lives across continents with her wisdom, compassion, and genuine willingness to listen. She approached every challenge with grace and determination, inspiring those around her to embrace the unknown with courage and humility. Cheryl's adventurous spirit knew no bounds, whether she was long distance running, scaling mountains, traversing remote landscapes, or simply savoring the beauty of the world around her. Her love for life was infectious, drawing others into her orbit and creating a community bound together by laughter, by shared experiences, and most of all, with love. So let us take a moment to center ourselves in the presence of peace and compassion as we come together to honor the life of Cheryl Lauer. And please won't you join me in the spirit of prayer and meditation. With hearts filled with loving kindness and minds steeped in wisdom, we invoke the boundless compassion of the Buddha and all enlightened beings. In this sacred space, may we reflect on the impermanence of life, understanding that all things are transient and interconnected. Let us embrace this truth with equanimity and grace, 
knowing that death is but a part of the natural cycle of existence. With each breath, let us cultivate mindfulness, bringing our full attention to the present moment. May we find solace in the beauty of impermanence, cherishing the memories of Cheryl and holding her close to our hearts. As we offer our prayers and stories, may we honor the life of Cheryl Lauer, wishing her peace, liberation, and freedom from suffering. In the midst of grief, let us find refuge in the love that transcends all differences present in one another. May love guide us through the darkness of sorrow and lead us toward the light of understanding and acceptance. As we gather here today, may our hearts be filled with that love, our minds be illumined with wisdom, and our spirits be uplifted by the power of compassion. With gratitude and reverence, we offer these prayers for the well-being and liberation of all beings, both living and deceased. Amen. Please won't you rise and join me in singing the hymn Blue Boat Home, the lyrics of which are in your bulletin, on the back side, I think. be seated. And I'm going to invite Charla, Emily, and Elizabeth Lauer to come forward to offer a remembrance. Hi, I'm Charla, second oldest of George and Nancy Cheryl. And like um, mom, named after uh, Cheryl, 
Cheryl named after mom, she was large and in charge, as we all know her. Um, you know, she was such a, a born leader. Um, even as a child, uh, she would, we, we lived in a, a college campus, a block away from a college campus at Edinburgh State College in Pennsylvania, and we had a three-car garage, um, but there were no room for cars because we had a big, huge playroom. Mm -hmm. And we would drag these um, sets home from the college theater and Cheryl would direct and write and direct us in plays and musicals. And, um, you know, it didn't stop there. It was the neighborhood kids and us three. And she was just always so organized and a great leader. And, and that didn't stop there, um, carnivals. So um, we did put on carnivals for muscular dystrophy and cerebral palsy and American Cancer Society. Mm -hmm. And um, we had, you know, sponge tosses, and and we had fun halls going through the garage. And this was, you know, Cheryl was the director. She was the one planning it all. Um, that's just who she was, as we all know. Um, have a memory of her in high school, um, marching band. We were all in band and singing, and um, she was raising money for uh, marching band. And so she was in this dance-a-thon, and. Um, she and Doug wore t-shirts that said Fred and Ginger, and they danced, I think, 36 hours um, <laughs> nonstop. And I just remember Donna Summer, MacArthur Park going on and on and on, and Cheryl still dancing. Um, and running was something we, we both enjoyed. Um, Hash House Harriers in that club, I got to run with her in, in the running club, and I think I even won the first time I ran with that group um, and we did our first marathon together and so I'll always remember that uh, 40 degrees and raining hard in Washington DC um, Marine Corps marathon and she has the pictures up in her um, closet now which was really touching along with all of her medals you know a lot of people would hang their medals out where everyone can see them but not Cheryl they're in her in her closet <laughs> um, and last thing I wanted to say um, great memory I have of is just cooking with her I went to visit her in Thailand, and that's the only country where I decided before I left I had to buy a cookbook. And so whenever I'd visit Cheryl um, and her family, you know, she would say, what do you want to learn how to cook? And so I'd pick something out of the cookbook, and she'd teach me how to make it. And we'd listen to the BBC or jazz and drink a little bit of red wine, and, and I would be her sous chef. And uh, those, those are great memories. And here's Emily. Say a few words. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, so a few Lauer sister facts. Um, the obvious one already. So our height and age correspond. You can't quite tell because of shoes. But Cheryl is the oldest and the tallest at 6'1", right? Whatever, 6 is something. Charlotte's second, 5'11". I'm third, almost 5'9". Elizabeth's actually 5'8". <laughs> um, so there are two brown-eyed sisters right here, Charlotte and Elizabeth, and they take after dad and our uh, maternal, or yeah, Grandma Lauer. And then Cheryl and I were the blue-eyed sisters, and we take after mom and Grandma, Na or Grandma Alice and our great-grandma, actually. So we're fourth generation blue eyes. And we used to have little competitions. It's weird the things you can compete about as siblings. <laughs> um, so you've already mentioned the names, so I'm not going to do that. Um, we love to sing, and mom taught us to sing in harmony. And I think we're all sopranos, but we had somebody had to take a part. So we did that by age. So Elizabeth was the soprano, Charla and I sang the middle part, and Cheryl was the alto. And we were kind of known in certain communities like church. But some of you here have heard us sing. We would practice in the car on our family trips in the old station wagon. And mom would bring her pitch pipe and give us a note. And we'd all rehearse. <laughs> Um, so great memories there. Um, lesser known things about Cheryl is that she was a great seamstress. She would sew her own clothes, including lined suits, as did Char. And I have a distinct memory in high school of Charla and Cheryl really into sun tanning. 
and they would lay out in the yard <laughs> at Edinburgh, Pennsylvania with the radio and their magazines, and Cheryl was really into Vogue. Now, we were in this very small college town. The house behind us had um, a dairy farm, so Vogue magazine was kind of a big deal. <laughs> And Cheryl also was a trendsetter in high school. I remember she would wear things to school and I'd be like, you're wearing that? Like, whoa. And then a few months later or a year later, other people in high school would catch on. Yeah? <laughs> so I wanna just close with saying that there's so much to say, right? But as her sister, the, the generosity of her heart is so big, which is why you all are here today. We've all been touched by her. I got to forget you guys are right down here in front of me. <laughs> and including like her former husband Tim, she and he and Cheryl, when my mom had a spinal cord injury, they brought my parents into their house for months to live with them and had them there many times. And as we all know, Cheryl in cooking, when she would come with Owen and Mitchell out to Utah, the first thing she did was create a menu for the entire week <laughs> of food which was great, and her, um, her parting words to me, I saw her a week before she passed, and she said, I'm sorry, I couldn't be a better host to you, Emily. <laughs> and I wanna tell Cheryl that she was a good host because she created this beautiful home that I was in, and a lot of you here locally provided food for us. And if you didn't see Cheryl at the end of her life, you were still there because your cards and your emails and your gifts and your flowers, everything came into that house and was a part of the love that was there. So thank you all. Thanks, sisters. I'm Elizabeth Lavenu. It's wonderful to be here. I'm just taking all of you in and the fullness of the love in your presence here today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so in a little bit, I'll be singing Amazing Grace with my daughter. And I chose that song today because Cheryl really embodies amazing, right? Wow. And grace in so many ways. Her gracefulness, her graciousness to all that she encountered. And... Um, so I wanted to share just a little bit about an experience that I had with Sharla when we were saying goodbye. So we got to come in January and say goodbye to Cheryl and spend some time with her. And when we were, just before we were getting ready to leave, we were holding hands and I was crying. And Cheryl looked at me and she said, it's just my body that's dying. It's just my body that's dying. Yeah. And the, the love, the immensity of that felt to know that she was experiencing that. And that soothed me so deeply. Her surrender into dying was grace, was filled with grace. She embodied letting go, that ability to, to walk, to care with immense patience and compassion for herself in her process. And I know that many of you have experienced her compassion and her, the way that she lived her life was also filled with grace, integrity, joy, curiosity, right? Just like so much beauty and so much goodness that drew grace to her and I think many of us experienced that grace in her final months. And grace really is reciprocal. You know, as we embody integrity and curiosity and prayer and practice, Cheryl has a lifetime of spiritual practice that draws grace to us. And I really felt that within Cheryl as she was letting go and as she knew that she had just a month or a few months left, um, that she, she surrendered. And the strength that that took for her to just be at peace. And that allowed so many caregivers 
so many of us just could feel that peace and could really be soothed and comforted ourselves just being in her presence. What a gift. What a gift. And grace is also freely given as we've experienced divine grace just flowing through her in those months as well. And so I just want to thank Cheryl for teaching us in her dying how to live, really live. So thank you. Well, as a uh, minister, I'm generally used to speaking for 20 minutes, right, Robin? Uh, 20 minutes, uh, that's what you have? Uh, Yeah, okay, 20 minutes. Well, today it'll be much longer, but uh, no, I'm on. I did write out what I'm going to say and uh, things so we won't ramble on. Uh, First of all, I want to welcome all of you here today. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. It's appreciated by the family. And uh, I know all of you probably knew Cheryl in a different way. And that's what's so special. Many of you have had experiences with her that we never had. Because I live in Utah, and I've been there since 1980. I've been the pastor of a Presbyterian church there. and then. Uh, a United Church of Christ in Orem, and then we went to uh, overseas to Asia for three years. So we have missed a lot of what you have had in relationship with Cheryl. So cherish those times. Cherish them because they're yours, and they're special for you and Cheryl. So I just wanted to welcome a few people in particular that have traveled a good way to be here. I don't even know whether they're here. Jeanette and Jeff Fink, are are you here? Way way in the back, raise your hand. Okay, they they have come from San Antonio, Texas. They flew in just today, so representing their side of the family. And in a sense, they're here for their own service because Jeff's mother died and in a few weeks they're going to have their own service in Illinois. So it not that the way it is in life. We just rejoice as we can with our loved ones. And then we have Tim Fink from Denver. Tim, would you raise your hand? Way high. <laughs> okay, Tim. My... Uh, <coughs> Tim's a very special person. We've seen him. He came to visit us in Alaska, and we drove down the Alaska Highway together when he was younger, and that was a real experience. Tim, thanks for making... (laughs) Yeah, thanks for making the effort. Uh, There was a woman that came from Chiang Mai, Thailand, for the last three weeks of Cheryl's life. This is Linda. And Linda was in the Peace Corps with her. And she came for three weeks to take care of Cheryl at the end of her life. And I hope she is able to Zoom with us, although I hate to say it's 4 a.m. there. (laughs) But maybe she, she got up to be a part of our experience, and we hope she did. So... And we also want to just make mention of some of our local people that have done so much. Uh, Roger, Roger, are you here? Where is is, uh, Roger here? He he was able, Roger's in the back. Thank you, Roger. Roger uh, was the best man in the wedding of Tim and Cheryl, which was in a really nice hotel in New Hampshire. Is that right? So you were the best man, and he also has helped with her final arrangements uh, financially and all that. Uh, He works for the uh, city of Boston. And uh, Roger, thank you for all you have done at the end of her life and uh, what this is 
meaning for you. And then a few lo local people just, just wanted to share. Again, the, the uh, Bell family. Sidrine, you're, you're an angel. Yeah, Sidrine has been over to the house so many times to help out in so many ways. And your family is unique. And George, George Bell was just like a brother. George was a brother to Cheryl. They would do marathons together and all this. They were always so close together. And we have a photo of them on Cape Cod when they were young. Both of them were at the beach, at Nobska Beach. And they had their little bathing suits on and they were fighting over a toy. <laughs> and they would grab it and run and then the other person would grab it and run. And we have, we have a movie of this. <laughs> so <laughs> it's recorded. <laughs> But they were so close together for so many years. And again, the Bell family has been right here with, with them. And again, we thank you. Their four children are here and they're musicians. Uh, what a joy to have them involved in that. Okay. The end of life was at 11.16 p.m. And we want to remember people not at the end of their life. We want to remember them as most of you knew Cheryl when she was alive and well and doing her thing with you. So this is what we remember, not the end of life, as, as my family said, when the body begins to deteriorate and is no longer functional for you. And then, as you well know, if you happen to be of the Christian faith, then when you give up the body, you take on the spirit, and the spirit lives with you in heaven for the rest of your life. So we certainly re -life, re rejoice in this. So let's shift back, and I'm going to share some things you don't know about Cheryl. These are some things you don't know, because when N Nancy and I were, were married in uh, South Dakota in 1961. My first job was the pastor of the Presbyterian Church in Anchorage, Alaska. So we drove the Alaska Highway, and it used to be gravel and dust and all that, and we worked our way up there, and it was so exciting. But my wife was so talented as a nurse practitioner, some doctor was so excited that she came to town because he was looking for an orthopedic nurse. And he snatched her up and was so excited to have her uh, on his staff. And uh, so they, they, they worked together for a good while. Dr. Wickman, he was, and I'll always remember Dr. Wickman because when Nancy got pregnant and her doctor said the last two months of your life, you have to stay in bed. You have to stay in bed or you're going to lose the pregnancy. The pregnancy was Cheryl. So isn't this unique and so important for us to realize that this is what the situation was for her? So Cheryl arrived healthy on August the 16th, 1961. And always remember, when I came from the hospital, I was driving down the road and I was so excited. My first child, and it was so great. And one of the ladies from the adult class in our church was walking along. And I slammed on the brakes and jumped out of the car and went over and told her, and we, we gave each other a big hug because Cheryl had arrived. And it was so special that she was now beginning her 61 years of living upon this earth. So let me say in, in conclusion, I don't want to talk about our family. I want to talk about your family. What are you doing for the rest of your life? What are you going to work on to make life better for you and your neighbor? Because remember, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. 
So let's, let's spend our time figuring out, first of all, who our neighbor is, and then how we can better reach out to them. But work on taking care of yourself. Taking care of yourself. It's so important. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you don't have anything left over to give to anybody else. Because you're exhausted and you're not able to function in love for other people. So, what a joy it is to have each one of you here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your involvement with Cheryl. And uh, let's, let's get on with life. And, Let's get a, you young people here, look at all the years you have yet to go. <laughs> get your act together. <laughs> what, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to be? Don't worry about being anything. Just know that God loves you as you are. Okay? Okay. Amen. <laughs> Thanks, Robin. Okay. Thirty-nine years ago, this July, I met Cheryl in Chicago where we were gathering as incoming Thai Peace Corps volunteers. We were embarking on the seminal adventure of our lives. No one could imagine that day how significant this new path would be to our future selves or how much Cheryl would be a significant part of that journey. She was a leader from day one and she continued to bring us together right up to the precipice of her farewell. I know I speak for our group and many of you here today when I think of the abundance of her friendship and personality. Cheryl has been an incredible mother, friend, teacher, and connector, and I am grateful for the many lessons I have learned from her. She lived with gratitude Cancer gives you incredible clarity. It is a difficult diagnosis, yet Cheryl understood that she was very fortunate for access to great health care and a brilliant medical team. She understood very well the challenges of the world and recognized her privilege of shouldering this disease so close to great doctors and friends who quickly encircled her. We were all so grateful that she had the community she deserved. Cheryl lived in friendship and was uniquely generous in this regard. It wasn't enough for her to be your friend, but she wanted her friends to draw closer to each other. And we did. Her cadre of Peace Corps friends were so touched to hear that her sterling posse hiked Mount Wachusett in honor of Cheryl on a perfect blue sky day and had a toast for her at the top. She lived with optimism. A friend of ours who has also spent his professional life in development work shared how easy it is to become cynical about the work. But he observed that Cheryl was always able to resist the negative. She was always, always professional and completely dedicated to the mission. And it wasn't just her professional optimism. I spoke to Cheryl as she prepared to enter hospice, and even at this time in her life, she was at peace, her greatest concern being the boys and preparing them for losing her. This immense loss has imbued me, and I hope you, with an understanding that life can be very limited. And while we should all hope to live long and purposeful lives, we should also treat every day like it is our last. We have a lot of time and also no time to waste. I think that is what Cheryl wanted to teach me and us. Each of us is allowed a moment in the linearity of time to make our mark. Cheryl chose her mark wisely, creating legacies of goodness, hope, and fortitude. 
Her sons, Owen and Mitchell, were imbued with these characteristics and will carry forth her innate grace. We are all inspired by her life and know that she entered the light knowing she was worthy of its eternity. Forever peace, dear, dear friend. My name is James Chen, and I'm blessed and honored to have been Cheryl's friend. When I think of Cheryl, three qualities immediately come to mind. Love, passion, and leadership. Love. Cheryl was full of love. Her love of good food was only equaled by her love of good friends, family, Peace Corps friends, whom she regarded as family, and above all else, her love for her boys, Mitchell and Owen. Passion. Cheryl was passionate about so many things. Food, travel, adventure, nature, books, success, running, good health, life. Not only was she a marathoner, she was also a triathlete. Leadership. Cheryl was an entrepreneur, a humanitarian, the ultimate organizer, and a connector of people. Seldom would there be a gathering of good friends and good people without Cheryl being an integral part of it, even now in her absence. But there was one quality of Cheryl that she kept unpretentiously to herself. She hinted to it in a LinkedIn commentary that she titled, 50 Shades of Brown, Can a Crummy New England Spring Make Me More Resilient? Resilience. Cancer is not kind. It is not merciful. It can be cruel, unforgiving, and relentless. Undaunted by her diagnosis, Cheryl prepared herself to run her most challenging race, the equivalent of back-to-back -back marathons. But she did not run this race alone. She had many friends and family members cheering her along the way. Her medical team, her close friends, including the local community in Sterling, to friends spanning all four corners of the world, her Peace Corps family, her cousins, her stepmother, her stepdaughter, her sisters, her father, and of course, her boys. In addition, there were many kind souls who cheered for Cheryl in their own indelible ways, including Louise Penny, one of her favorite authors. Mile after endless mile, Cheryl carried herself with poise and unwavering strength as she ran through some of the most difficult emotional conditions. Apprehension, determination, frustration, reflection, hope, fear, loneliness, exhaustion. It was the distant cheers from her friends and family, as well as her love for her boys, that would rekindle her spirit to continue on. Barely able to stand, Cheryl leaned on the shoulders of Shauna, Sadrine, and Roger as she limped into her final mile. Linda, a guardian angel from Thailand, picked her up and carried her the last 100 yards. As Cheryl crossed the finish line, she was showered with warm hugs and kisses, lifted high in the air by her boys, and carried off into the sunset. I imagine that is how Cheryl will want it to be remembered. Doing things she loves to the very end. As I look around, it is clear to see that Cheryl has touched all of our lives. As we say goodbye to Cheryl, 
I am reminded of a line from a Beatles song. And in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. Cheryl, you are a badass <laughs> and a true champion. You will always be held high in our hearts and you will be dearly missed. Hello, I'm Bobby Kalunai. I met Cheryl at the College of Worcester in 1980. Our friendship grew and deepened during the 40 years following college. Cheryl was an incredible friend who stretched me and helped me to grow as a person. We have a close group of friends from Worcester who get together every five years or so. The year we turned 50, we met at Grant's house in Saugatuck and had our 50 palooza. <laughs> Late at night after much laughing and some drinking, uh, we shared each of us an intention for how we wanted to live our lives. Cheryl's intention was to live boldly. And did she ever. It was awesome to see her boldness, becoming an endurance athlete, a business owner of Fulcra, an engaged parent, and a person who built deep connections. Bold was her superpower. Today, I want to share with you how I experienced Cheryl. To me, she was this marvelous melding together of boldness and fun with perceptiveness and insight. At Worcester, Cheryl worked at the reception desk in our student union, and her welcoming style was familiar to all. She was stylish even then, though in a preppy tradition. She stood there behind a case of M&Ms, which she doled out for sale, always with advice for free. She really seemed to know everything. Cheryl majored in political science. She was a disciplined student, organized a mastery of boundaries, every day planned out with a balance of running, studying, work, and of course, fun. She was voted most outstanding senior woman, which was well-deserved. Some of the memories I treasure most from college were the fun and performative aspects of being in Cheryl's circle. She loved to dance, especially to Motown and also Earth, Wind & Fire. Cheryl was always up for a lighthearted caper, especially with a the theme. For example, a lip syncing contest where Cheryl was the leader of leader of a pack with her mini skirt and cat-eyed glasses. And for Halloween, we dressed up as Charlie's angels disguised as French maids with Grant as Charlie in a white tux. <laughs> Cheryl, Jill, and I were in the Worcester's dance company, and one performance stands out distinctly in my memory, and it was Cheryl's most embarrassing moment, she told me. It was during Parents Weekend, and we wanted to do a dance in the wild all over the campus. And we started with a dance Jill had choreographed in flowing purple dresses, rejoicing out on the pack, back patio at Worcester. And then we went upstairs, did a quick costume change in black leotards and our leg warmers. And um, we went up to the dining hall. And imagine our artistic anticipation as we queued up hot lunch jam from the movie Fame. Um, and Cheryl and I were at opposite ends of the room, the dining hall, and on the signal, we burst into the room doing split leaps across the salad bar <laughs> to the amazement and astonishment of everyone there. Only there was a problem. The boombox wasn't playing any music. There was silence, confusion, and no one was following us. So Cheryl and I sheepishly circled back to do it all again uh, amidst much embarrassment from us and laughter from the rest of the dining hall. But that's a good illustration of Cheryl's boldness and fun. After our Worcester years, I settled in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Cheryl went off to Thailand and then to travel through Asia and Europe. And we found creative ways to get together every year and wrote each other regularly. 
I have found solace in the past month rereading over 70 letters from Cheryl. Most of these letters predate cell phones. What a gift it is now to see her cursive writing on that thin onion skin paper and hear her distinct voice that came through her writing. These letters were loaded with rich descriptions of her environment, the night market at Chantaburi, the magic and chaos of Bangkok, drawings, Gary Larson cartoons, and always Cheryl's quirky humor. She shared her thoughts on everything from materialism to religion to gender roles, along with personal updates on romance, career, family, and what she was reading. Here's an example. Thailand breezes carry a jasmine scent, cooling me off at day's end. Spicy, tangy sea seafood soups and sweet coconut curries over steaming rice. I'm sticky at two in the afternoon, eager for my bath. Girls with shiny black hair flash smiles. A flat electric green expanse of ripening rice is broken up by stilted houses, an occasional tree, and water buffalo. The papaya vendor chants his sales pitch through the street. Malaga, Malaga. Cheryl was a great observer of people, organizations, and culture. She said, I want to be a traveler, not a tourist. I want to experience the culture instead of pursuing a list of must-sees. I admired how Cheryl constantly pursued learning and developed new skills. She would research, hire coaches, develop mastery, and then expertly teach us all what she knew. She taught me so much from how to cut an onion the most efficient way, which means I think of her every day, um, and how to do a strategic planning workshop. As a friend, Cheryl asked great questions and provided essential support. We celebrated the joys and supported each other through the sorrows of our lives, careers, health challenges, deaths of family members, births of children, parenting. She provided both advice and accountability. In one humorous letter I found from 1995, she titled it, Resolutions Passed by the Honorable Lauer and Kalunai, and she enumerated the 10 things that I was going to do in the month following our call. <laughs> Cheryl was encouraging, and she lifted me up. She sent letters that opened with, how's your spirit? She sent birthday cards that shared how grateful she was that you were born and how much you contributed to her life. Cheryl was clear about her desire to be a mother and have a family, and I loved seeing her heart open even more as she fell in deep love with her sons, Owen and Mitchell. She delighted in their interests and shared her own passions for travel, exploration, and inquiry. You gave her such joy. Over the past month, I've been thinking of a meditation I learned where on the inhale you say, with every breath, and on the exhale, I am closer to death. With every breath, I am closer to death. Now it might sound a little morbid, but the real key is that by facing your death, you know how to live your life and what's important. Cheryl knew this, she embodied this with grace, determination, and courage before and after her diagnosis. She lived full out she knew that time was precious, and she sought out joy and happiness. Cheers to Cheryl. Her life was a blessing. tricky part about going last is there's a lot of commonalities here. Um, <clears throat> I'm so honored to speak about Cheryl from the vantage of her Sterling community. It was a privilege to be a witness to her life and her inimitable spirit. I'm speaking for so many of us from Sterling and her many and varied friends when I say she was a treasure. Cheryl was a doer, whether hosting a Thai dinner party planning a scavenger hunt during her wine and women night, yes, we had those, or holding joint birthday parties with our kids featuring laser tag, airsoft, 
manhunt, or galvanizing support um, for a Sterling Community Theater show. She always took the reins, and she did it with gusto. Similar to her work as a strategic planner, she made her guests active participants in her parties. Cheryl would hand over the knife to get your help chopping items for authentic pad thai, or ask the kids to pick the runs we were gonna do on the ski trips. There was no sitting around with Cheryl. You were an integral part of the party, and she always made you feel needed, wanted, heard, and valued. And despite not always being up for Cheryl, what Cheryl wanted you to do, I'm thinking of some half marathons she signed me up for and some January running challenges. She, um, you always felt better for having done it. She pushed you to be a better version of yourself. Cheryl also had a natural gift for building community, connecting people, and physically bringing people together. Nothing would have made her happier than seeing everyone gathered here today. She was a generous and thoughtful friend in so many ways. She was never a gatekeeper. She relished introducing people to each other whom she knew had similar interests, hobbies, or professions. She truly enjoyed watching new friendships blossom. I'm sure you all have memories of her innate curiosity, but she was mostly curious about people, the way they thought, and why they thought that way. She once told me that she never felt she never truly knew someone until three things had happened. She saw their handwriting, she knew their birthday, and she saw where they lived. Some of the words that resonate when thinking of Cheryl are authentic, direct, not a poser, she said what she meant, and she meant what she said. She had an insatiable thirst to learn, spanning from watching YouTube videos on Kibby body type and style, that's a thing, you can look it up, to hiring personal trainers, striving to become a better runner and swimmer, to owning what feels like over a million cookbooks, to being a catalyst for change and growth in her work. Cheryl was beyond inspiring. She had a knack for breaking down challenges, articulating points clearly and succinctly, and finding where the hang-ups lie to make things work better. Um, you may know this, but she was not afraid to provide constructive criticism. <laughs> <laughs> but she had a distinct merriness and warmth to her, and she was decidedly not uptight. Incredibly, she had the same attitude of learning and curiosity towards her illness and took each chapter as it came, handling it all with grace. In all the medical appointments and treatments I attended with her, I never saw her bitter, which was unfathomable to me. Instead, just like Cheryl, she befriended her chemo nurses and charmed the entire care team. That was who she was. Personally, I knew Cheryl in a few different ways. She was my day one friend here in Sterling. I met her on the playground at Houghton Elementary School when Mitchell and Connor were two and Owen and Liam were on the kindy soccer fields. I have the privilege of knowing her as a fellow parent, one of her hustler friends. There were six of us and we can tell you about it later. <laughs> um, she was a traveling companion to me and we also worked together a bit when she provided strategic planning consultation at the nonprofit where I work. While she holds superlatives for myriad talents, from marathoner to gorgeous skier to masterful facilitator, what stands out to me and what I saw up close and firsthand was what an incredible mother she was to Owen and Mitchell. Always diplomatic, measured, consistent, reassuring, and most of all, loving. The proof is what fine young men you are today. I see her in both of you in different ways and know how incredibly proud she was of you. Her legacy will live on in you and throughout your lives, you'll tap into the invaluable gifts she modeled through her endless love. We're all incredibly lucky to have known Cheryl in the various capacities we did, but you are so blessed to have known her as your mother. May her wonderful qualities and gifts endure in you and sustain you throughout your whole lives.
was blocked, but now I'm free. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and fear. and snares I have I have already come tis grace that taught me safe thus far and grace will grace will lead I'm Sidrine, and I had the privilege of being Cheryl's cousin because I married into the family. And um, in remembrance to the lovely uh, camping trips that we had in um, Cape Cod, I chose a poem by Mary Oliver, who made her home Provincetown. In Blackwater Woods, look, the trees are turning their own bodies into pillars of light are giving off the rich fragrance of cinnamon and fulfillment. The long tapers of cattails are bursting and floating away over the blue shoulders of the ponds. And every pond, no matter what its name is, is nameless now. Every year, everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads back to this the fires and the black river of loss, whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones knowing your own life depends on it, and when the time comes to let it go, to let it go.
Hello, everyone. I'm Roger, um, a friend of Cheryl's for 30 years. And before reading a poem, I'd like to just share um, a couple of memories that I have of Cheryl um, and uh, celebrate the friendship, the great friendship I had with her. To me, Cheryl was affectionately known as Shirley, and she loved it when I called her that. <laughs> we recently celebrated 30 years of friendship. Our lives were connected in many ways, ways that continued to surprise us over the decades. I remember an exchange that illustrates this for me. Having known each other for about 10 years, I let her know that my, I have a sister named Cheryl, and I had always called my sister Anne by her middle name. And when Cheryl learned that I also had a sister with the same name, she was over the moon. She was thrilled. And to her, this meant that there were many unhidden connections that still uh, were ahead. And there were ways that we were connected that we didn't yet know about, and we would continue to uncover those. She reminded me about this periodically, and I can still hear her voice teasing me. She would often say, so what else are you hiding from me, Swartzy boy? <laughs> Cheryl sparked energy when she entered a room. My Peace Corps friend Paul knew Cheryl from refugee work in Thailand and introduced me to her when he moved to Boston when she moved to Boston. Years later, Cheryl went to Ottawa to visit Paul and his partner, Montasser. While she was there, they joined a group of about 15 of Paul and Montasser's gay friends at Meech Lake, not far from Ottawa. Before starting out for a swim, Paul and Montasser checked in with Cheryl to make sure that she would be comfortable with the others on the dock until they returned. When Paul and Montasser returned 45 minutes later, they found that Cheryl had become the life of the party. <laughs> Everyone was raving about her. Cheryl is so nice. Cheryl is so much fun. I'm so glad that Cheryl came today. On the ride back to Ottawa, Cheryl talked with Paul and Montasser about the guests, recalling each one by name, telling Paul and Montasser new bits of information about their friends. The host contacted Paul and Montasser soon after, saying, your friend Cheryl is fantastic. Please tell her that she has to come back. Paul and Montasser are here today from Ottawa. We've been looking at photos and recalling stories about Cheryl this weekend with my partner Boyd and our friends, Cheryl's friends, Leah and Arnaud, who are here for the service from France. Cheryl loved connecting. Cheryl loved being connected. Cheryl loved connecting others. I'll continue to look to Cheryl's example, finding ways to harness her energy so that I can practice connecting in life as an offering to her. I'm grateful, Shirley, for connecting with you in life, in death, and in new ways going forward. The following poem offers reassurance, reminding me that Cheryl and I are still and will always be connected. And I'm going to uh, just strike the singing bowl. Oneness by Thich Nhat Hanh. The moment I die, I will try to come back to you as quickly as possible. I promise it will not take long. Isn't it true I am already with you as I die each moment? I come back to you in every moment. Just look, feel my presence. If you want to cry, please cry, and know that I will cry with you. The tears you shed will hear us, heal us both. Your tears are mine. The earth I tread this morning transcends history. Spring and winter are both present in the moment. The young leaf and the dead leaf are really one. My feet touch deathlessness, and my feet are yours. Walk with me now. Let us enter the dimension of oneness and see the cherry tree blossom in winter. Why should we talk about death? 
I don't need to die to be back with you. Hi, everyone. I feel um, really privileged to be leading this service today. Um, you may or may not know this, but this is not Cheryl's church, and Cheryl did have a church. Um, raise your hand if you're here from the Harvard Unitarian Universalist Church. Okay, oh, look at all my friends. Good. Okay, so her church is here. And I'm sorry you haven't been mentioned yet, but her church was a really important part of her life as well. And I met Cheryl 10 years ago at the Harvard Unitarian Universalist Church where I was preaching. And she was, uh, I, I was like guest preaching there because I was friends with the minister, Wendy Bell. I still am friends with the, the minister who is no longer there anymore. Um, and she was so excited to meet me because she knew I was moving to Sterling. And I was so excited to meet her, thinking I would poach her from the Harvard Unitarian <laughs> Universalist Church. Um, but no such luck. She loved that church, and she also thought that this church was too Christian, because it is. It's a Christian church. And the one thing that she said, George, when we were planning this service, is that I was not allowed to use the word God. And then you did. <laughs> so I just want that said for the record. Cheryl, if you're listening, it was your dad and then your sister who sang Amazing Grace, and that was not me. OK? I am capable of leading a UU ch church service without saying the word God. It's such an honor to be here with all of you. I used to see her. We have uh, kids the same age. I have a senior in high school as well, and so I used to run into her at Choxit Games, and she wrote to me while she was dying, and she said um, that she wanted me to come see her, um, that she hadn't been to church since the pandemic, and um, she was wondering if I would come see her, and I. Um, I was on leave at the time, and she said, I'm so glad you're taking care of you. When you come back from leave, come and see me. Um, and I, when I came back from leave, it was too late to see her, and that makes me really sad that I didn't get to connect. But I did want to tell you how she ended her email to me, which was to say, I am at peace. And um, she really did teach people how to die. You're absolutely right. Cheryl Lauer passed away peacefully at her home in Sterling on the night of February 29th, 2024. In her words, she was a global consultant who has lived and worked on four continents, somewhat funny, an explorer, a change partner who walks beside my clients, a growth junkie who is always learning, an endurance athlete and skier, a weather geek, a world traveler self-isolating in a small town in Massachusetts, a mother, a darn good cook. In her family's words, Cheryl was a generous friend, an explorer, adventurous mom with a curious mind. She was characterized as being well-read, well-traveled, and the center of her circle of friends. In the words of her obituary, Cheryl was someone people noticed. This is another reason why I liked her. She's like one of the only women in Sterling who's taller than me. <laughs> Standing over six feet tall, taking long strides when she walked, and comfortable being the leader and organizer, Cheryl usually dressed with a distinctive international flair and truly listened when someone spoke. Her love and wisdom included a mix of insight and humor that respected and valued others, but that wisdom was combined with a guffawing sense of fun, sinking on a sea dew while dressed as aliens with a friend, originating the unexplainable two ducks in a bathtub joke, which by the way, I never heard, running in cartoon pattern shorts down the dirt roads of Thailand. Born in Anchorage, Alaska, right after the earthquake on August 16, 1962, Cheryl was the oldest of four daughters of George and Nancy Lauer. 
Her mom was a nurse practitioner and her dad was a loquacious Presbyterian minister. Her childhood and teenage years were lived in Edinburgh, Pennsylvania, where George was, just, was a college chaplain. The family home was a social focal point for the neighborhood and a home full of play, sledding, games, and plays performed in the garage and fundraising carnivals held in the yard, directed and organized by Cheryl. Music filled the home with Cheryl playing piano and flute and singing harmony with her three sisters and mother. The family only had one car and Cheryl, her mom and sisters walked to the Methodist church to go to church where she often sang with her sisters. Adventure permeated the years the family of six piled into the station wagon for cross country trips and national park visits to places like Utah and Alaska. Days were spent hiking, camping, skiing, and exploring. In high school, Cheryl was wicked popular and got good grades. She even won a 36-hour dance-a-thon with her friend Doug. After graduating from the College of Worcester with a BA in political science in 1984, Cheryl joined the Peace Corps as an English teacher in Thailand from 1985 to 1987. Cheryl was in the Peace Corps, uh, after the Peace Corps, she. No, while she was in the Peace Corps, she taught English in a small village on the border of Cambodia. Immediately following her stint in the Peace Corps, Cheryl and her friends, um, and her Peace Corps friends, went to travel all around, including to Italy, Thailand, Tibet, and India, where she got malaria or dengue fever, one of those two things, maybe both. <laughs> she even spent time at Mother Teresa's hospital for the sick and dying. Her Peace Corps work began an internationally focused career that included Cambodian refugee program management, program coordination for John Snow Incorporated in Asia and Africa, an MA from the School for International Training in Brattleboro, Vermont, and then organizational development and training for All America Financial. Cheryl was as you know into fitness, sports, Pilates, and just generally being active during uh, the, her early years, Cheryl also went from hash house harrier runs across four continents to running marathons, devoting each mile of a marathon to a different person as gratitude for appreciating the now of that mile. She picked up running again when the boys were old enough to not choke on something home alone. They said that she ran to get away from the everydayness of parenting young children. So she was just running from her children. <laughs> she was very structured and goal oriented and running was like meditation to her. Cheryl met Tim Cunahan in 1997 on a plane. She fell asleep while I was talking to her still, he said. But <laughs> But she came up to him afterward and he gave her his card. If you are ever back in the neighborhood, let's get lunch, he said. Tim lived in New Hampshire and Cheryl lived in the south end of Boston at the time. And since he worked in Somerville and Davis Square, they got together for a first date in Boston. They eventually moved to the south end together and soon after they moved to Sterling in 1999. They were married that year in Sutton, New Hampshire with just a few friends as witnesses. Tim's in-laws came to live with them uh, before he even got married to her, <laughs> as Cheryl's mom had become quadriplegic and needed rehab at a Boston hospital. Though she continued to run and find adventure, and before she started her own Fulcra consultancy company, Cheryl stepped away from her international career to focus on family for 15 years, raising her two sons with her husband, Tim. Their sons, Owen and Mitchell, now 22 and 18, grew up with the love and kindness exemplified in Cheryl and with her same curiosity for question asking and exploration. Always devoted to her boys, Cheryl's only re regret in her life was that she had to leave them. Her sons remember days of adventure and fun with their mom. From a very early age, they took lots of interesting and fun day trips. They have iconic memories of going to Providence and Davis Farmland, going to the lake, lots of camping, tons of trips. And they were unusual trips to boot. They'd get in the car just to watch ski jumping in Burlington. Let's take all the kids and do the swan boats, she'd say to her friends. 
She found the quirkiest things to do, like meeting up at a tapioca bar at a Vietnamese place or making little duck costumes for the Make Way for Ducklings parade in Boston. Their first international trip was to stay in Thailand for a month, which opened the boys' eyes up to a lot. Cheryl spoke fluent Thai, and the boys got to do tennis camp in Thailand, saw sculpture parks and temples. Mitchell even got into massage and never wanted to leave. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't ask a lot about that story, but it's cool. <laughs> we'll connect later, okay. The family also traveled to Canada, the UK, France, Switzerland, Utah, Vermont, New Hampshire, Florida, and various road trips. Tim had a daughter from a previous marriage named Erin, and Cheryl relished being her stepmother and the grandmother of her two children. When Tim and Cheryl divorced eight years ago, she remained active in Erin's life, delighting in her children. Cheryl was an avid reader and cooking class watcher. Getting people together and cooking Thai food were her specialties, as she was always entertaining. To quote her beautifully written obituary again, the focus on her boys, on growing and moving, and on international perspectives and interests always stayed with Cheryl, from the pictures and hangings on her walls, to the multiple tea selections, to her close friends scattered around the world and across the United States, to always finding time to travel, take long runs, and ski, to both local and distant adventures with her sons, to her amazing cooking with diverse spices and rices, including her pad thai, which was immediately loved by her nieces and nephews. And Cheryl stayed in close touch with Peace Corps friends, loving the regular reunions and the laughter and memories and continuing travel adventures that they shared always having a stack of new books to be read, and always looking ahead with plans for friends and family gatherings, usually with good food and better laughter. Cheryl persisted in that optimism and planning through her ovarian cancer treatments, and she is probably still striding ahead into the next adventure with gratitude and laughter. She'll wait for you there, her obituary said. Isn't that so beautiful? I didn't write that. <laughs> In his timeless poem, Oneness, Thich Nhat Hanh beautifully articulates the interconnectedness of all beings, the inseparable bond that unites us in a vast tapestry of existence. He invites us to recognize that we are not separate from the world around us, but rather intricately connected to the grass, to the trees, to each other most of all and even to our beloved dead. So as long as we have breath, we are linked with Cheryl Lauer. Her work is now ours to do. And so in her name, may we cultivate habits of mind and body, and may we infuse adventurous fun in everything we do. Let's make every day a special occasion worthy of a costume or a dance and raise our children to remember that the world that we live in is small and interconnected and has a good deal to do with love as its center. May we cultivate a deep sense of connection with all beings and may our actions be guided by love, compassion, and reverence for the interconnected web of life. For in embracing the truth of oneness, we awaken to the boundless potential of our shared humanity and we discover the infinite beauty that lies within the heart of each and every one of us. Cheryl's feet touched deathlessness and her feet are ours. Let us honor Cheryl's memory by living our lives with the same sense of purpose, wonder, and joy that she brought to every moment. For in so doing, we keep her spirit alive in our hearts forever and always. Cheryl Lauer, well done, good, and faithful servant. Amen. Please won't you pray with me. Spirit of life and love in whom we are one, 
In this lonely time of grief and sadness, as we mourn Cheryl Lauer, we look for peace and assurance that the world will still spin and we will still go on despite the hole that the death of our mother, stepmother, former wife, sister, aunt, grandmother, friend, neighbor weaves in our lives and in our hearts. We, we hold all who mourn today in comfort, most especially the family of Cheryl Lauer, her father George and stepmother Linda, her sisters Charlotte, Emily, Elizabeth, her former husband Tim, her sons Owen and Mitchell, stepdaughter Erin and son-in-law Scott, and grandchildren Jack and Ada. In our grief and sadness and shock, contain and comfort us Embrace us with love. Give us hope and grace to let go into new life. May this dark grief flower with hope in every heart that loves her. May Cheryl continue to inspire us to enter each day with a generous heart, to serve the call of courage and love until this earth is like it is in heaven. In the silence now, we lift up our hearts for healing and for wholeness. We pray all this for love's sake. Amen. Our final hymn is in your bulletins. We've changed the words so that it doesn't say God. <laughs> so, but it is a hymn that really embodies the spirit of Cheryl, so I'm so glad we're singing it. Please, won't you rise in body or in spirit and belt it right out. Before I deliver the benediction, I would like to invite all of you, and yes, I mean all of you, into our parish hall where we are serving you a full Thai dinner, so you better stick around for it. Um, all you have to do is follow the crowd. I will, uh, I will dismiss you um, after the benediction. Um, I will dismiss the family first, and then I will dismiss the rest of you, okay? And then you'll just follow the crowd. Spirit of life be with us, giving us the peace that passes understanding and the assurance of those things that never die, that which passes from person to person through the generations unto eternity. 
beauty, goodness, truth, and especially love. Beloved, emerge out of the sanctuary with something to accompany your sadness. Walk into time and let it heal. Walk into nature and this beautiful evening and let it enliven you. Walk toward other people and share your exuberance. Eat together. When the snow melts, plant flowers again. You are still needed, so live on and give on. In the spirit of love, we have gathered, and in the spirit of love, we depart. Amen.